Okay, well, I guess it is 12.01, so it's time for us to get started. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us uh, on our fourth webinar or uh, get together for the Building a Culture of Rights Community of Practice. Today we are going to be chatting about connecting with the everyday and I wanted to begin by sharing a little bit about what we were thinking when we came up with this theme. We at the last webinar, we had Christine Durant from the Poverty Roundtable in Hastings Prince Edward share a little bit about how she does human rights in her anti-poverty work. Uh, and one of the ways she does that is really connecting with the everyday. So this meant connecting with people who are doing sort of grassroots work around poverty elimination. With that in mind, we thought that today we would delve deeper into that by speaking with two uh, individuals, one in Port Colborne and one in, U in the Yukon and Whitehorse, who are connecting with the everyday in their work. They sometimes use a language of rights uh, in their work. They are very much grounded, I believe, in a human rights approach, and I look forward to hearing more about them. Before we get any farther, I want us to quickly look at the technical considerations. Thank you. Uh, if you have any problems, please type it into the question box. We will get back to you shortly. We have a couple of our Matri staff here who can help you. For in terms of audio, your computer audio is the is your best bet. If you can, if not, then the phone call option should work as well. Uh, in terms of participation, we certainly do want to hear from people on the line. I'm thrilled to see some familiar names from the last community of practice calls and webinars. The best way to do this is to use the hand function. It's like a raised hand uh, and we will see you. We can unmute you and you can either ask a question or you're always free to type it in the, ch in the questions box and either myself or one of the, the panelists will, will uh, take the chance to respond. Okay, on that note, next slide please. Uh, I just want to get the chance to introduce our two panelists that we have here today. Uh, I'm going to begin with Lori Kleinsmith. She is a health promoter at Bridges Community Health Center in Port Colborne. She has been there since 2009. Um, she's the chair of the Niagara Dental Health Coalition, the co-chair of the City of Port Colborne Social Determinants of Health Committee of Committee Council, and a facilitator for the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network Wages and Work Task Force Group. She is also a member of the Ontario Human Rights Commission Community Advisory Group. I'm thrilled that she's going to join us today uh, and talk a little bit about some of her work around dental health advocacy. On that note, I will throw it over to Lori for your um, your thoughts. Thank you. Oh, oh, thanks, Kate. Um, so, hi everyone. Um, I'm not on uh, the the webcam, so I'm just speaking through my phone. I hope uh, everything can be heard clearly. Um, so, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background. If we could um, go to the next slide. Um, that uh, just gives a little bit of a uh, background on the work that I do um, every day and my involvement with um, the issue of access to dental care. So as was mentioned in my bio, I, I work as a health promoter at um, Bridges Community Health Centre uh, in Port Colborne. Um, we also have an office uh, in Fort Erie, Ontario. Um, we are, community health centres are an interprofessional model of health care, um, really with a uh, the design to treat the whole person. Um, we're grounded in addressing the social determinants of health, so things such as poverty, housing, um, and food security, um, all of the, the factors that impact a person's ability to achieve optimal health. Um, often the people that we serve at our centers face difficulties or barriers accessing, um, trying to access primary health care services. So that's um, a, a unique feature of community health centers is that we are designed to break down some of those barriers. Um, we're one of over 75 community health centers across Ontario, and there are community health centers uh, scattered across the entire country. Um, our staff include doctors, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, social workers, dietitians, outre outreach workers, and so on, and health promoters such as myself. At our center, we regularly see clients who are experiencing dental health issues, and some of these issues are 
very serious and, and very urgent, um, uh, requiring um, immediate attention. But we have no way to, um, to provide services to them. We do not have um, a dental suite or operatory at our community health center. Um, this has really led to our involvement in advocating for access to dental care. Uh, and in 2014, um, our center completed a dental health survey and report um, covering our catchment area, Fort Erie and Port Coburn and Wayne Fleet. And this led to the formation of the Niagara Dental Health Coalition in 2015. And the coalition works very closely with a provincial dental advocacy group called the Ontario Oral Health Alliance, or UHA for short. Um, Members in both the Niagara Dental Health Coalition and in UHA include um, community health centers, public health units, <clears throat> excuse me, dental hygienists, um, and some different social service agencies. Okay, um, next slide, please. So the issue that um, that really is uh, defining where my focus is today is the lack of access to dental care for Ontario adults living on low incomes. Um, so just a quick background on the issue. So dental health care is not covered under Canada's universal system of health insurance, which is known as Medicare. Um, despite being recommended um, when Medicare was being formed back in the 1960s, um, it was recommended that dental care be included under Medicare the same way that access to doctors and hospital care would be. Um, it was excluded for several reasons, um, and some of those reasons include dental professionals at the time um, really fought back and did not want to be included under Universal Medicare. They preferred to remain in private practice. Um, there were, at that time, um, a shortage of dental health care professionals, and they felt that they would not be able to cover a universal system. Um, the, at, that, at that time, fluoride was in most municipal water systems. Um, and there was also a, a significant focus on individual responsibility for one's oral health care. So in the end, there was a targeted recommendation for access to dental care included, um, but it was um, made really for children, uh, social assistance recipients, and expected mothers. Um, but given that the teeth and gums are part of the body, and that infection in the mouth impacts the rest of the body and is linked to multiple chronic health conditions, it does seem that this was a huge oversight in the the development and creation of our of our healthcare system in in Canada. So the majority of dental care is privately financed, as most of us who have access to workplace health benefits would know. Um, and then there are certainly people who have the means to pay out of pocket. So 62.6 percent of Canadians have private dental insurance. 5.5% um, have coverage through publicly funded programs. Um, so, for example, in Ontario, we have a program called Healthy Smiles, um, Ontario for Children, age 17 and under, who can access um, dental care. But it's only for that particular age group. Um, and then 31.9% of all Canadians are uninsured, so they do not have private or publicly funded um, access to, um, to dental care. And this 5.5% of publicly funded programs is really, really low compared to other um, developed countries in the world. Um, we spend less on publicly funded dental than even the United States does. And a lot of people find that, that um, quite shocking to hear. Um, we also know that there are some ways that discrimination plays into, um, into this issue. So. Um, those with access to publicly funded dental programs, such as social assistance recipients, often have difficulty finding a dentist who will provide services to them. Um, there's various reasons for that, but there's low reimbursement rates in publicly funded dental programs, so the provinces are not paying the full fee schedule that a dentist um, has set um, that they would receive through private insurance. And of course, there are stereotypes of people who live in poverty and who receive welfare, um, such as perhaps the, that they may be more frequently miss appointments, that they're lazy, that they don't care, take care of their oral hygiene, and so on. Um, I know of examples of municipalities in my area where none, zero, 
of all of the practicing dentists will accept patients who are in receipt of social assistance. And there was even a recent news article that quoted a dentist in Windsor, I believe, saying that some dentists will not provide services to children whose benefits come from the Healthy Smiles Ontario program. So this is a, a, a systemic issue, um, and it's I think a lot of it is rooted in, in discrimination, but there are definitely there are factors around the reimbursement rates. Another way that I see this as a discrimination issue as well is that government, provincial, territorial, um, federal government, has not provided sufficient access to publicly funded dental programs, nor access to alternative models of publicly funded dental infrastructure, such as perhaps mobile buses or including dental suites in community health centers and so on. Um, this means that charity is often where people are turning. Um, charity is often left to try and bridge the gap, but that's really an inadequate way of, of trying to deal with this problem. Um, in Niagara Region, where I work, we have a dental loan program, which is wonderful to have that opportunity. However, it only serves a few hundred people a year. The demand is significantly higher than that. There are probably thousands of people who would access, need to access this loan to do net needed dental work and are unable to. Um, I really view this as a lack of progressive realization of the right to health in Canada. Okay, next slide, please. So some of the challenges, um, private dentists are not required or obligated to accept patients who are in receipt of publicly funded dental insurance as a means of payment. Um, there are certainly some uh, dentists who do. Uh, they feel, you know, that it's absolutely apparent that, that, that that's something they feel they would not turn anybody away who's in need. Um, but often many of them are taking on more than their fair share um, when many of their colleagues are not taking any um, anybody who's receiving publicly funded programs. Um, so I find that I find this really challenging because although access to social assistance is a protected ground um, of discrimination, um, a benefit such as dental that is directly tied to being in receipt of social assistance is often denied. So I'm you know trying to really get my head wrapped around how. Um, how this could be challenged um, down the road somehow. Um, other challenges, of course, is that poverty and social condition are currently not a protected ground under the Ontario Human Rights Code. Um, there is rights-based language often missing on this issue. It's not really that commonly used. Um, I find that, you know, I struggle to 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 bring it forth in, in the work that I do. Um, we often use terms like barriers or um, health equity or fairness in, in talking about some of these issues um, as opposed to really fully exploring it through a human rights lens. There is also um, a huge challenge, in, and, and I've alluded to this already, that there is a lack of government funding and investment um, provided to publicly funded dental programs, um, whether it's paying for a program like social assistance that has a benefit that people can take to a private dentist, or seeing this as an opportunity to invest in publicly funded dental infrastructure and operations um, in al alternative models. So in Ontario, we have some community health centers and most public health units with dental suites, um, but certainly not all. And most of them are really focused on providing service to the Healthy Smiles uh, Children's Program. Uh, some centers have volunteer dental professionals who provide services to adults on low incomes, but this is really not sustainable or consistently done across the province. And in Canada, there are also some issues not only with government funding, but a lack of really a diversified oral health care settings and dental professionals. Most work is done in private clinics. Um, an overall lack of a dental strategy um, has really led to piecemeal non-cohesive public dental programs across the country. And we also are lacking in um, national oral health standards of what treatments and services should be provided, like a basket of services that should be covered. So there is there is nothing laid out um, across the country in terms of what should be provided in, these, in our publicly funded programs. Um, so for example, um, in Ontario, Ontario Works, which is our um, one of our forms of social assistance, um, 
just dental services are provided on a discretionary basis, um, but every municipality has a different way of providing that basket of services. Some provide only emergency, some provide coverage for dentures, some provide preventive and restorative treatments. So it's, it's not consistently uh, delivered. I feel that there really is a lot of room for improvement at the government level to ensure a, a more rights-based approach is taken um, to address the many shortcomings in publicly funded dental. Um, it requires champions. Um, we don't have a lot of people standing up and, and speaking loudly on this issue, particularly within government. Um, there are people doing it for pharmacare, so a national pharmacare program. There are champions within government, but I'm not hearing champions within government speaking out on dental. Um, and Really, the last two challenges I'm going to speak to in my last slide, but raising the profile of this issue and getting it on the on the radar of decision makers, I'm going to give you some examples of um, of what we've been doing um, locally and with our provincial advocacy group to address this. So, flip to the last slide. So, some strategies. So, um, so locally, um, our the Dental Health Coalition has completed um, some surveys. I mentioned the one that we did in 2014, and we most recently uh, conducted one um, in 2017, specifically looking for people who face barriers to accessing dental care. And we received 1,334 responses to our survey. So this went out through agencies and, and online. We used a variety of techniques to try and gather survey responses, but it was it was overwhelming um, how many people responded to a survey in, in a six-week period. It was um, uh, really, to me, showed showed the magnitude of the issue. Um, we've used our, our media, local media, multiple times, um, highlighting the issues in local papers. Um, there's also been lots of work done by other um, advocacy groups in their communities. And getting it really onto the national radar, um, CBC Radio has done some some really great shows over the last few years highlighting this issue. Um, and one thing that, that we were able to do was to provide um, and connect a local person from Niagara who had reached out to us when we had done our survey in 2017. Um, and she felt comfortable enough to speak um, about her at her issues and how it's impacting her life. Um, and she was interviewed for the CBC radio program um, to tell her lived experience uh, story. Um, so that's, I think, very, very powerful to t try to tie um, the data with, um, with the stories. Um, but then we've also, you know, realized that we need to use some political um, strategies on this as well. So we've uh, taken an, an angle with municipal resolutions. Um, in over the last couple of years, we've had 17 different um, Ontario municipalities pass resolutions calling for um, for access to dental care for low-income adults and seniors. And about an, a year and a half ago, um, the Ontario Oral Health Alliance um, worked to get um, petition signatures from um, thousands and thousands of people across Ontario um, presented in the Ontario Legislature. Um, and we feel that this response to the petitions really opened the door for us to be able to start meeting with political parties to advocate for dental care in the upcoming provincial election. And we're really, it's been great to see the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party has already included um, access to dental for seniors in their platform, and we hope to see it in the other um, two party platforms, major party platforms as well. And just to really just to wrap up, um, I think that advocating for the passage of Bill 164, um, which is a private member's bill here in Ontario, to amend the Ontario Rights Human Rights Code to include a number of conditions, but one important one I feel is the inclusion of social condition as a prohibited grounds for discrimination, um, that that would go a long way to being able to, um, to raise this as an issue to then be able to bring in access to dental care and, and other things under that um, under that umbrella. Um, so I really do hope that we will be able to get there at some point. Um, but 
In the meantime, you know, one other example of a way that I've been trying to raise the profile is working with um, submissions to the United Nations um, through uh, a national group called Canada Without Party. They've uh, sent in um, submissions to the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Review, as well as the upcoming uh, Universal Periodic Review. And I asked that dental care access be included um, specifically in those submissions. So, um, so it is being raised. Um, it's just not necessarily at the point where we we're seeing the, the following actions yet. But I feel that we're on the right track. So, um, so I think I will leave it there. I'm not sure if we're doing questions now or if they're at the end. So I will turn it over to Kate. Oh, hi, Laurie. Thanks. Hi. Um, I'm just going to make sure you can see me. Uh, thank you so much for that. That was really helpful. And I think that you really illustrated how the lack of access to dental care is a systemic issue rooted in discrimination. I really appreciated, too, how you spoke about um, the, the value of tying sort of these data with, with these stories and as well sort of the relationship to the the various levels of government, municipal and provincial, as well as, um, as at the international level, uh, too. So on that note, I think if there are any questions from people who are listening, feel free to either raise your hand or to type them into the questions box. Uh, we will have more of a chance for a fuller, fuller discussion at the end. We do have one hand raised here. I'm going to try to unmute you, Natasha. Natasha, do you have a question? Oh, yeah, this is Natasha. I'm calling in from Vibrant Communities. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, yeah, I just had, Laurie, you mentioned that um, the, the dental programs across the country look different in different provinces because there's no one um, strategy. And I'm just wondering if you know of any examples from different provinces who are doing better in terms of dental programs and, and what that their strategy might be. Yeah. Um, well, I wish I had a I had some really good examples. I, the one that I that does stick out to me is um, Alberta, uh, and they do have um, funding for a, a seniors program, so um, that particular population um, is able to access um, a basket of services. Um, you know, it, it it certainly would probably not look the exact same as what um, those of us with private insurance would potentially be able to go and, and get whatever treatment we needed but it is it is a, a to me a, a, a good step in the right direction in terms of having um, a, a particular basket of services that seniors can access um, I'm not particularly a fan of you know kind of segment segmenting and isolating different populations you know I would really like to sort of see this as you know um, people without the means to pay, um, the, the, the working poor tend to get left out of most conversations, um, uh, as well as just some of the issues with social assistance are, are going to look different from province to province too. So, But I do know that Ontario spends the least amount on publicly funded mm -hmm. dental out of all the provinces. So um, even though we have a great kids program, that's about where it ends. Thanks, thanks, Natasha, for the question, and thanks for your answer, uh, Laurie. It's helpful. Maybe if anyone else in the who's listening has any thoughts from their provinces, if they're not from uh, Ontario, they they could either uh, share with us later or or perhaps write a comment in the um, questions. Uh, um, box. So on that note, it looks like we don't have any more questions. So I think we're going to move on to our other speaker. I didn't get a chance to introduce her earlier, but I'm thrilled we are also joined by Kate Mecken from the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition. Kate has been working with the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition since 2012 uh, in a variety of capacities, most recently doing advocacy and outreach within the community of Whitehorse. She also works with the out, with the outreach van. Um, she is a representative for the Yukon on the board of, on Canada Without Poverty on their board of directors. We heard Laurie mention board of Canada Without Poverty earlier as well. So perhaps we can maybe chat later about some of the ways that they, CWP facilitate some of these discussions around rights. Uh, Kate lives with her partner and her two children on their organic farm off-grid in a year just outside of Whitehorse. So on that note, welcome Kate. Thanks. Can everybody hear me okay? 
Awesome. Uh, okay, great. Thanks so much for inviting me to participate. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide, I think. Please and thank you. Right. So that's our lovely Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition logo. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I'll just do a really quick overview about um, the Yukon Anti-Poverty Coalition to give a little context to uh, what we're doing here in Whitehorse. Um, so uh, we're just over 20 years old, um, uh, started in a very grassroots way and um, uh, with a really strong commitment to poverty elimination. And, um, and we do that through raising awareness, um, through advocating uh, at a grassroots level and through lots of action in different sectors of the community. Um, so our membership is quite large for such a small jurisdiction um, in that we have over 470 members. Um, and the really neat thing about the coalition is that we're not just um, individuals, but we represent, um, we're, we're a bit of an umbrella organization. So we represent a lot of NGOs um, and representatives from different businesses and the faith community. Um, so in that capacity, you know, members participating in our, in, in what we're advocating about our, we're, we're able to share this sort of um, perspectives from a, a cross section of the community. It's not just, you know, the in-house, um, our viewpoints or, or, or our, um, or our co-chairs viewpoints, it's, it's, it's pretty broad. Um, so our mandate really quickly to foster the development of strategies and activities to reduce poverty in Yukon, to pro promote awareness um, and um, help provide a voice for Yukoners living in poverty. So that's that person with lived experience first voice perspective that we're working harder and harder to integrate in everything we're doing um, and to coordinate efforts and info regarding poverty. So uh, that's just really briefly about the APC. Uh, next slide, please. So really broadly, we have sort of three arms that we're trying to tackle in our advocacy awareness and action, and that's um, food security, housing and homelessness and access to services. And access to services for us includes um, <clears throat> looking closely at income, um, looking closely at access to medical and dental care, like Lori was talking about earlier, um, access to recreation, um, so whatever that might mean. So um, I just thought it would be useful to outline a couple of different initiatives we have on the go on a consistent basis. We're, we're also pretty project driven, but um, these, these initiatives are some of the things that have emerged out of uh, out of our membership, um, trying to fill gaps on the ground for people. Um, so Sally and Sisters um, arose out of uh, a group of women coming forward to the coalition, um, suggesting that women and children didn't feel safe accessing food at our local Salvation Army um, and soup kitchen. And so there was a lot of women and children going hungry. So. What ended up hap happening was a partnership between the food bank, um, this group of concerned women, and the Salvation Army. And um, through that, we're able to um, provide a separate meal um, on Mondays and Fridays uh, for women and children only um, at, on, at the food bank as opposed to at the Salvation Army. And there's also a Wednesday lunch at our local women's center. Um, 60 Selkirk um, is our White Horse Affordable Family Housing um, units um, <clears throat> and excuse me, uh, we have we advocated the Anti Poverty Coalition advocated really strongly to have a program coordinator and tenant support coordinator um, because our the way our Yukon Housing Corporation works is that um, they're more of a landlord, not so much. Um, in the position to be providing any support. So the support piece was a huge gap that we were hearing about. Um, so the 60 Selkirk is sort of um, our first crack at providing support on the ground for, in this case, young single parents. 
Um, I won't get into White Horse Connects too much because I'm really going to focus on White Horse Connects um, in my next couple of slides because that's really our on the ground promoting dignity kind of initiative. So I'll just skip by that. Poverty and Homelessness Action Week has happened every year for us since 2008 and sort of emerged out of some of what's happening across the country in terms of um, raising awareness about poverty and homelessness. But we really wanted to have a consistent dedicated week every year where we can um, from a variety of different perspectives um, raise issues that are really raw for the community at the time and so sometimes we've really focused on housing and homelessness um, other years we've really focused on food security um, other years have really been a mishmash um, one of the really awesome things about FA. Um, is that um, it often, because it's during October, it's often uh, fallen around a municipal election or a territorial election. And um, one year we had the territorial and federal election all at the same time. So we were really able to use um, Poverty and Homelessness Action Week as a forum to sort of engage um, elected officials and you know future elected officials to um, get a sense of where they stood on um, poverty issues and human rights. Um, so it's about dialogue. We have to bring a speaker. We do really on the ground action oriented events. Um, Food Network Yukon um, has come over the, around this need for um, people to be tackling food insecurity and um, food sovereignty issues we have here in, in Yukon. Um, I'm sure many of you hear about how um, urgent food insecurity is in the north. Um, Yukon's quite different from Northwest Territories and Nunavut um, in that we only have one fly-in, fly-out community, um, unlike the other two territories. That being said, we do have, um, uh, it's many, like 15 different communities, many of which don't have grocery stores. Um, so we do have the sort of food de desert kind of situation and many people commuting hours in to access our um, grocery stores here. So Food Network Yukon is farmers and uh, food security advocates, researchers, um, some government officials municipally and territorially, um, all kind of coming together and collaborating on different food issues. And I'm going to talk also about our storytelling, leadership and advocacy for people with lived experience in future slides. So that's just <clears throat> some, excuse me, some of the on the ground initiatives that we're working on that really makes up what YAPSI is all about. Next slide, please. Okay, so White Horse Connects. I'm really pleased to be able to talk about White Horse Connects because it's just such an awesome, awesome event um, that really came out of um, trying to tackle how we, um, living in, in such an isolated community, how we can connect um, very isolated people together, really vulnerable people together. So not only with the services that they might need to know about, um, but an opportunity to access services that they wouldn't ordinarily. Um, and also, most importantly, to connect them with each other so they feel a sense of, so people feel a sense of um, um, community, so people feel welcome, um, so people start to realize that they're not the only ones facing um, some of the really raw and real challenges that people living with low and no income experience every day. Um, so we've had I probably over 30 White Horse Connects, um, and they happen three times a year. Um, we try and do one in the winter uh, because it gets really cold here, so it's nice to gather. Um, and we do one in the, the early spring or early summer, sorry, and then one again around Poverty and Homelessness Action Week. Um, so next slide, please. So like I sort of mentioned earlier, White Horse Connects is really about building ties in the community. So we just actually held our winter White Horse Connects on January 31st. And again, it was a really, it was really successful. Um, we had uh, over 180 guests. Um, so the really neat thing about White Horse Connects 
in terms of providing services that people don't otherwise access is it's an opportunity for businesses to um, sort of step up and provide a little time to people who don't normally step through their doors. Um, so for example, hair to haircuts um, and every year um, or every White House Connects, we hear how valuable um, it is for people to, to access haircuts. Um, and not only do people need haircuts, but it also helps with this really awesome confidence building and making people feel really good about themselves. Um, we provide, um, we sort of rotate who provides what, and it kind of depends on, it's really um, driven by our guests and what they indicate that they want. So this, um, at the end of January here, we had some healing touch. Um, in the past, we've had massage. Um, we tried drop-in counseling this time because we heard that people kind of want that, um, you know, instant crisis counseling support right there in the moment so we had a counselor on site um, meals is a huge part of white horse connects obviously um, gathering people around food is always a really good way to engage people um, it's particularly important when you're working within first nation communities um, there's a large first nation population here coming from all different um, uh, first nations across the yukon um, excuse me. And um, so in terms of the funding for Whitehorse Connects, um, we don't have core funding to provide it. So we largely rely on either fund fundraisers that the Anti-Poverty Coalition is doing, or um, we do apply once a year for some United Way funding to support one Whitehorse Connects. It's usually around in October around Poverty and Homelessness Action Week. Um, other times we've received donations as we did for our winter white horse connects we uh, a local landlord decided um, that their tenants could um, choose an organization to donate their full year's rent and so we received three thousand dollars to put towards the white horse connects which is pretty amazing um, so white horse connects is all about partnerships so we like i've mentioned already we really work with the business community to to provide services um, we have local chefs um, and our health promotion unit um, that provides good, healthy meals. Um, and part of this, because we have so many valuable partnerships, um, that sort of has a um, snowball effect and um, we're really able to get a wide variety of volunteers from youth, from the faith community, um, you know, students doing their community service hours, and we have retired individuals and kind of anywhere in between. Um, and because of that sort of snowball effect and momentum, we really get a lot of community buy-in. So um, we get a lot of clothing donations um, from community, again, just the financial donations that help with the purchase of uh, mostly food. Um, and in terms of service agencies that are present, um, it, it provides a good opportunity for local agencies to present what it is they're doing and try and engage people. So we might we have, um, for example, our friendship center that always comes and talks about medicine wheel and um, kind of holistic health care and what they're doing in terms of their different programming. Um, we have um, the outreach van that comes and they hand out dog food and hygiene supplies. Um, so those are just some examples of, of services that come. Um, it's opportunity. In the, in the winter, sometimes we do immunizations. Um, there's always a uh, blood pressure clinic. So um, some nurses from home care come and, and can check in with people that way. Um, uh, the last three points here are also really set the mood and provide kind of this um, celebratory uh, feel, uh, live music. So musicians play half an hour sets, just kind of background music, but it really sets the tone. And that's something that, um, you know, folks who are homeless or, you know, low income, they're not paying to go to a bar to hear live music or they're not buying tickets to go um, to see uh, someone play at the art center so it's just an opportunity for people to feel like you know they're deserving of this and that really is what white horse connects is about supporting people to feel that they are deserving and that they can access these services um, in a really dignified way 
Um, we have a, a local business um, that provides family portraits um, at Whitehorse Connects, which is probably one of the most touching and beautiful parts of Whitehorse Connects. And so if anybody's putting on these events, I highly recommend trying to include some photography in there. Um, and why this is so important is because oftentimes people, um, the way people are connecting is such in such a um, fractured way. Families are connecting. Some families, particularly because the way Yukon set up is people come into communities or families are split up. Some are in Whitehorse, some might be in Pelly Crossing or in Old Crow. And, and Whitehorse Connects actually brings families together. You know, they may not have seen their family for six months. And so if everybody's at Whitehorse Connects, they can snap that family portrait right then and there. And it just sort of captures that moment in time. And it's really, really touching and um, something again that people don't, uh, people aren't spending money on family portraits. So, and, and we um, just recently started to include crafts and Whitehorse Connects. Um, so um, beadwork this past time, we uh, had people making medicine wheels and it also keeps kids busy so that their, their parents and family can engage in some of the other services that are, uh, that are to offer. Um, so, and ev we never, you know, every time we do a Whitehorse Connects, guests are overwhelmingly thankful and really, really eager to return and have amazing suggestions around what could help. Um, and um, the piece around human rights and dignity and why this applies to Whitehorse Connects is because um, we call them guests for a reason, because we want to welcome them as as guests and members of our community. We do not use Whitehorse Connects as an opportunity to survey people or to research people. Um, we use it as an opportunity to connect people and to honor people as, as really valuable um, contributing members of our community. Um, so I think that's Whitehorse Connects. If there's questions about that, we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, next slide, please and thank you. So the other um, project that I mentioned a little bit earlier that we're working on, and it, this is sort of applying to many different facets of what the Anti-Poverty Coalition is doing, um, is really around engaging first voice. So engaging people who have lived experience of any number of issues um, for poverty in general, but um, specifically homelessness, specifically food insecurity, um, and really drawing on the expertise that people have and um, Yapsi is really working hard to advocate for the need to have uh, a person with lived experience at every single one of our tables. So we sit at a lot of, um, you know, government level tables that's looking at policy changes and, you know, these sort of broader systemic and structural changes that need to happen to address um, poverty related issues. And, um, you know, there's tremendous value in having people with lived experience at the table, particularly when you're developing policies and programs. And it's just nice to have a sounding board to know, hey, do you think this is, is something that would be helpful to you or to other people that you know on the ground? Because what happens inevitably when we don't include this first voice is that we continue to create policies and programs that don't actually echo people's experience. And it, it, it doesn't work. And then you know, we sit back and go like, huh, well, nobody came or um, people aren't, people aren't, you know, obeying our policies or our rules or our guidelines. Well, it's because we didn't do what we needed to do to make sure it was going to actually work for people or, you know, fill the gaps that are need, that need to be filled or, you know, we create more barriers for people. So um, this past summer, we um, summer 2017, we hired a summer student to take on this storytelling leadership and advocacy process. And um, what that entailed was basically um, finding eight, eight or so individuals um, who have lived, ex lived experience of poverty um, and were really interested in some level of education and training on how they might um, share their story and connect their story with, um, you know, in an advisory capacity. So um, it, it was kind of for, for people, it was kind of going to school for 
uh, for eight, six to eight weeks. And they, uh, there was eight, maybe 10 sessions of workshops and training. Um, and it was really awesome because different leaders in the community doing different things around advocacy came and facilitated the workshop. So it wasn't just one person, you know, talking at people, you know, or lecturing. Um, it was really on the ground useful um, stuff for people, media, tra media relations and public speaking training, um, how to use your story for healing. And then, cause that's, that's a huge piece of it. The story can be really raw for people. Um, but what part of the story can you tell that, that is useful for people to hear and, you know, in the process, not triggering, triggering yourself. Um, and then, so that really helped ground people um, and um, sort of, you know, acknowledging that it's totally okay to be emotional, emotional about your experience and your story. Um, and that's definitely going to happen, but that uh, with a little training and um, with a little support, having this peer network support, um, your story can be really empowering for others, people to share, but also really useful for community members to hear, um, you know, who, who can then say, you know, no, this, this issue is really important to us, you know, this, you know, we have too much homelessness happening here and, um, now because we've heard from this person we understand how complex that is and the barriers that are in place and etc cetera, etc cetera. so um uh, and you know in the storytelling leadership and advocacy we really did rights education and helping people to realize what their rights are because i think that in a lot of ways people just don't people have an intrinsic sense of what their rights are and they when they're being violated they they know that but they don't know what to do with that so that was definitely a piece of it um, and uh, we received funding and so we're able to provide honorariums for people's attendance in the workshops and that was just another layer of honoring people's stories and time and experience and so as we move forward hopefully we're going to have different incarnations in this but you know the paying people for their expertise is really becoming a best practice for the anti-poverty coalition um, and are trying to leverage support from government now uh different all, all levels of government municipal first nations territorial um to recognize people's expertise and to pay them for a t for their time because um, and then you know the other side of the coin is to not have people penalized uh, when they uh, for their income support because oftentimes people have to end up paying back that money um, if it's seen as as income so um, that's sort of a different level so i think that's it, I think my last slide, maybe you could just flip to that as the, the questions piece, but uh, yeah, that's just my contact information if anybody has any direct experience, uh, direct questions. Thank you so much, Kate. That was a really helpful overview of the work that YAPC does, and uh, thank you for tying it into sort of your approach to taking a human rights framework into this work. Does anyone have any questions for Kate at this point? Again, you can raise your hand or um, or type it in the question box. Don't seem to see anyone. So perhaps I'll get Lori back on the line as well, and I'll, I've got a couple questions for both of you. I'm not sure how many we will get through, but uh, at least it, it will allow for a little bit of a conversation. Uh, Lori, are you there as well? Yes, I am. Great. So you both spoke about human rights uh, in your work, and I think you both talked about your sort of shared work with organizations like Canada Without Poverty and others. How do you find that the guests or the clients that you work with, do they connect with the language of rights? How, does, how do you talk about rights um, with sort of stakeholders in the work that you do? Maybe I'll, I'll ask you first, Lori. Um, <clears throat> well, again, I as I mentioned around the issue of dental, it's it has not been um, rights-based language has not necessarily been the dominant um, discourse. So I think um, slowly introducing it through terms like equity and, and fairness, um, I think are, are terms people uh, not even not everybody is necessarily even comfortable with some of those terms or using some of those terms. Um, I think. I think for the people that are impacted by the lack of, of access, um, it's really about barriers and and fairness uh, to them. You know, the the lack of 
the lack of fairness in our healthcare system. Why why are other parts of the body covered if you go to the hospital or your doctor, but if you have an infection in your mouth or your teeth, why can't that be treated? Why do I have to pay out of pocket for that? So um so I think there's I think there's just a lot of work to be done to start to incorporate that in on a regular basis. Um and so that's that's why I've connected with with Canada Without Poverty on this issue. And um, I think for me personally, it's going to be something I'm going to try to be more um, cognizant of in my own conversations with stakeholders, with with clients, um, in in media articles. Any opportunity that I have to speak out, that's going to start to I think become more more of the language that I'll try to incorporate. Oh, great, thank you. And what about you, Kate? Um, I think uh, using rights-based language on the on the ground with with people it can be a, a real challenge. Um, I think uh, my experience sitting at different tables with people um, is that there's a lot of there can be a lot of pushback to using rights-based language. Um, you know, I've I've sat at tables with uh, politicians who've straight out said, you know, housing isn't a human right. And so when there's a disconnect, um, when your leadership, when your elected officials do not recognize rights-based language or their their legal obligations around human rights, that has a trickle-down effect, right? So if, if our elected officials aren't using rights-based language, um, that means, you know, bureaucrats aren't going to be, that means you know, then in turn, it, it, we're not going to use it at an agency level because we don't. And then on the ground, people aren't going to hear that rights-based language, so they're just not going to use it. I also think human rights is such a broad, you know, it's this broad umbrella. And, and I often hear people speak in terms of Indigenous rights or women's rights, uh, disability rights, you know, sort of breaking it down into dim different, different demographic kind of categories as opposed to the the broad the broad sweeping human rights. So I, th I think we have a lot of work to do to educate people and, and to make people com feel comfortable to use that language and um, particularly for people on the ground to not feel as though they're going to be discriminated against or they're not going to jeopardize their access to services or their income support if they start to use rights-based language. I think there's a lot of fear. Hmm, interesting. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you both, which sort of picks up on, on some of what you're you're saying there around others that you work with. You both are involved with groups um, for UK to cross the Yukon, and for you, Laurie, it sounds like around around the province of Ontario. Do you have any sort of best practices you could share around sort of effective advocacy working with others in your in your sorry, inside and outside of your community. So sort of advocacy and, and how do you best connect with others who are doing this work on these really sort of complicated, complex topics, oral health care and again, sort of poverty in the Yukon. Laurie, oh, I'll start Laurie. with you. Yeah, sure, yeah. I can start. So um, I, I did, I mean, I, I, I provided some examples um, in yes. my presentation, but just to kind of tie them back in. So, you know, looking for opportunities to um, create things like a municipal resolution or a petition that can speak to anybody anywhere in the province um, was our was our goal so um, some of the ideas you know percolated perhaps at the local level but then we were fortunate to have the Ontario Oral Health Coalition which then was able to connect um, these advocacy opportunities to all of the different local grassroots coalitions working on dental issues um, across the province, and there are there are dozens of them in you know municipalities across Ontario that are working on this issue. So um, creating those tools, I think, is really important because otherwise, if 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 you don't, you're going to have you know the wording on. Well, somebody might say, "Well, let's do a petition." Well, the wording on one petition may not match the wording on another. Um, you know, it's confusing to politicians, I think, if they're getting all kinds of mi mis mixed messages on what the issue is. So we've really tried to unify and uh, create a consistent messaging that all of us across the province can take when we're speaking with elected officials or bringing forward engagement opportunities um, 
like the petition to to have that consistent message. So I think that's really been a best practice that that um, that we've embraced to try and to try to get the message across. Great. Thanks. And yes, I, you, I know you did speak about this earlier, so thank you for, for sort of yeah, uh, yep. elaborating some of those more. Um, Kate, do you have anything to add? I know we're down to five minutes, so I'm I, this hour has gone by quickly. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have too much to add. I sort of echo the, the you know, making sure your your key messaging is, is similar, you know, right. you're using the same kind of language and making sure everybody's on board and comfortable with that language. And again, um, going to people who have lived experience and, and making sure that that's language that reflects what the experience is. And um, so, yeah, that would be my input there. Great, thank you. Um, I just wanted to open up the, the floor one last time if anyone has any comments or questions. Uh, I don't see any questions or comments in the box but I will uh, let it stay open for another minute. I just wanted to give one last thank you so much to Kate uh, and so much to Laurie. You were both wonderful. I think it was a really helpful overview of how you connect rights to the work that you're doing. So thank you both for joining us today.